So today I would like to share with you the hard truth about force care. I'm gonna journal with you and tell you a little that I know. I've been a force parent for nine years, so I'll tell you what have frustrated me, but also maybe I can educate you a little so you can know really how it all works and how we get to be force parents. This is not based on anyone's experience, just my experience. Also, you have to know that every state and every county has its own rules. So what rules work for me or were against me, let's say in one county, are different than another force parent in a different county. So rules differ from county to county and state to state. So for me, what I'm familiar with are more of Oklahoma and North Carolina because I began force parenting in Oklahoma and then in North Carolina is where I live and have been a foster parent for the last almost six years. Before you become a foster parent, they have to check everything about you. Financial, you have to be able to pay your own bill and your own insurance. Your house, your house must be in a good foundation of footing in order to truly provide safety for the children. Windows work, uh, fire alarm, I mean, you have everything that needs to be safe for a child. If you want four kids, you better have at least four or two extra bedroom. Here's why. If you're planning to have a boy and a girl, they cannot share the same bedroom, even when they are siblings. In North Carolina, any child above five, you can share with your sister and brother who is four and five. But once you turn five, then the boy or the girl has to be separated. So that's really how it works, you know? But if you're same gender, you can stay together in the same room. Every foster parent have to be trained. So we are trained in two different ways. So you can choose to be a foster parent licensed through the county directly to the government. Like here in North Carolina, it's DSS. Or you can be trained through a private agency like me. That means I can take any child within North Carolina. If you're licensed by the county, you can only take the kids in your county. If you're licensed by the agency, you can take kids from anywhere within your state. So when children arrive, uh, most of them, there's, there's no information you're given about the child. You cannot blame the social worker. Why? Because the social worker just picked up the child that day. So they don't really know anything about that child. Usually only if they are on medication is the only thing you know. They give you a medication like, hey, he takes this every whatever. That's all. That's all you have. Otherwise, no much information. Most things as foster parents, we are the ones who get to figure out. We find out what the child need or more about it because they are living with us. So we get to pick up pieces here and there. Not always like they give you a spreadsheet of, hey, here's the information about the child. Or sometimes, you know, they give the child out, maybe it's physical abuse. You find the other abuse that they didn't mention before. The child told you. So you have to inform that to uh, the social worker. So there are so many things that we get to learn about the children that we were not given when we took in the child. Also, when we receive children, basically, most of them, if they're at school, then we have to figure out where is the child going to school. So that is my responsibility. If the child is not that far from the school, we usually keep them in the school so they can finish at least that semester at school. If they are going to the hospital, we make sure that, hey, if it's close by and it's the same hospital, well, just keep them to the same doctor. The other question is, who transports the child? Well, there are two ways you can transport the child. One, you as a foster parent, you can transport the child to the hospital, to the school. Then the other part is when they move far away from school or far away from where they used to live, from one county to the other, what happens? For me as a foster parent, I have to look for a school, look for a new daycare, look for a new doctor, look for a new everything. Most of them, even the social workers don't know where you live. And I, if I wanted to make it a little bit easier for me, I look for doctors or daycare or whatever it needs that is close by. So I don't have to be driving miles, miles away to look for one. The social worker will give you just, you know, suggestion like, hey, here are doctors in your neighborhood. Sometimes they don't know and they are 20 miles away. So what I do for me as a foster parent, I'm the one who gets to look for all those, the daycare, the school, the dentist would name it all for the child. So I am able to take them where they need to be. If you cannot do it, the social work always will make sure that child goes to the hospital, the child go to therapy if they need to, and all the appointments they need. 
For me, I like to take my kids to the doctor because I know them. If there was an issue before, I can explain what happened. But also too, most of the time, I don't have a history. So by me taking them to the hospital, I get to know the history of the child. You know, so there are also transportation. There are different ways our kids get to do things. One is visitation because every week they visit their parents. Also, they go to, to school. So school, who transport them to school if school is so far away, but they wanna keep them in that school? You know, what about other appointments that are really important that they need to keep? So who drives them there? Well, that is the social worker's responsibility. You let them know, like, I cannot. And the state or the county will provide transportation. Here's for me what I don't do visitation like i don't need to really most time you know the bio parents don't really know us or don't like us so from the start i don't want to cause that friction or make it uncomfortable by me being there so i would rather let the social work come and pick up the child and take them to meet their parents transportation can be really difficult think about if they have to go therapy once a week they have to go to school they have to go visit their family once a week like that's a lot of driving and if you have other kids it's really impossible to do. So here are also things that I can peer to. There are things that I can visit or be part of. So one of them is court day. Should I go to court to know everything about the child? No. Most time, it's really embarrassing for the family that you get to know the history because on court day, they, I mean, they give you a rap sheet of what they're going through and what they're facing. To me, I prefer not to for the first four or six months because I don't wanna paint I really, I don't want to paint what I'm hearing and have that ill feelings with the parents and the kids, you know? So for me, I prefer to not know until later. Also, at code, you don't always have to go, but you can call in, you know? They'll give you a phone call and time so you can call in and you get to hear rather than being there. So for me also, if I have kids who are above 13 years old, I prefer for them to listen. Here's why, some of my kids, Sometimes they blame me, I am the problem. Like, you're the one stopping me from going home. You're the one not letting me call my mom. My mom loves me so much, you're getting in the way. So I become the problem. But because we're trying to protect them, we don't really expose them to everything that parents are going through. So that is part of the, the really being a parent that is really, really hard as a false parent, that I know what's happening and I have to protect the child, but I can't tell them everything the parents are doing. But here's for me what I do. If they are 13 years old, I want them to listen, or if I go to court, they come with me. Here's why. I want them to hear it from first hand. I don't want to tell them something, or I don't want to assume that I can know. Like, I want them. I think at 13, they are old enough to listen and know what the parents are doing to get them back. And usually for me, I feel like they are old enough to go to court day or to listen to that phone call so they can hear it from the lawyer, the judge, and their own parents talking to them. And then after, I get to go so I can get to learn what happened and what are the issues and how can I advocate for the parents as well. But most of them, I just wait for a little bit. Therapists, who takes the kids to therapists? Most kids go therapists, absolutely. Which for me, is really helpful for me. So I prefer to go so I can get to explain, but also get to learn, be given a little bit of, you know, hands-on things I can use to help my kid. Since most time I don't know them and I'm learning about them along the way. I am 99.9 .9 responsible for the child. Going to the doctor, where they eat, behavior, like I have to deal and help the child because in some way they're, my own, they're like my children in a way. Here's a part that is really hard as a false parent. When it comes to decision making for the child, my decision or my opinion matters zero. I'm not kidding. That you get to be the one responsible for the child in every way, shape, form. But you even know where they're failing and you know how they can get better. And you're there in the trenches with them. You're learning. But when it comes to making decisions, either by the judge, you are never considered as a contributor. Zero. So here are the people who can talk for the child or on behalf of the child. The gala. Guardian of... Guardian at light. You know, they visit me once a month, once a month for one hour. They make notes, they ask me where the kids go to school. I tell them, you know, I tell them all that. And the social work comes every month, makes a report. I tell them, they are the only ones, only ones, they can face the judge and say, 
is what has happened to the child. Even when I'm sitting there and there's nothing I can do. So that's why sometimes they make decisions to take the child away or to make the decision for the child. And for us as foster parents, we are like, what? Where did you come up with that? How long does the child stay? Like most of you have asked me, how long does the child stay? Well, this is the most frustrating thing. Most time they come and say, hey, Peter, can you have the child for a weekend or even for a week? And I say, absolutely. That week comes nothing. The next week comes nothing. And you've already connected with the child. The child is already in school. And, and you're kind of left. I don't want to destroy the child's journey. I'm going to keep them. Or I'm going to keep helping. Because no one tells you when. And, no, and even when they know, they don't tell you when the child is going to stay. How long are they going to stay? Like in my case, most of my kids have come to know what's going to happen three years later. I mean, three years later that we passed the, the threshold, the required time. Like I advocate for kids to go back. Like I really do advocate for kids to go back to their bio parents. But the system in the way it's done, it's just so unfair to the child too. The child for so long, they're living in the limbo. Am I going home? Am I staying? Am I going? No, I cannot get attached to this family because I'm going home. But that's three months down the road. And then a year later, well, I can't be attached to them because I'm going home. Well, nothing. Two years later, I can't get attached to them because I'm going home. Now you see why kids live in the limbo. Here's the other part I want to share with you. Many of us, we hear voices from all over the place. Well, let me tell you what the children hear from different people. There's me as a false friend. I get to be the dad every day. But voice one. And then they have their bio parents who they get to meet once a week or every other week. That's another voice. So you have me <clears throat> who sometimes don't have the answer for them, but they have parents see on the other side saying, I'm doing everything I can. Ah, I'm going to have you back. And then you have voice number three, the social worker. The social worker says, ah, no, you are, uh, that isn't happening anytime soon. So you can see the confusion for the child. Wait, I have a foster parent saying I am doing well. You have mom and dad who's saying they're doing everything they can to get me back. Even most of them, they're doing zero, nothing. But to the child, the truth is what mom says is true. And then you have the social worker on the other side saying, mm, I don't know. I don't know. Tell me as a kid, who do you trust? Like, who do you listen to? And here's the other part too. Some of us who have kids who meet their siblings in different places. So they get to meet other social workers who have their siblings on once a week. So sometimes they have also another voice somewhere there. As a kid who's in false care, think about how that's confusing. Yeah, you get to hear different stories about your future, but no one tells you which one is real. And here's the ugliest part too, as well, is they meet their parents at their best. You know, for them to meet their parents, the parents have to come to the day social worker office. So they come to DSS and they're monitored by the police, by everyone, I mean, everyone is there watching them on camera. So they have the worst behavior. They have the best sweets. So the only time the child have seen mom, they're in good mood, they're happy, they're in a safe place. They bought sweets and all that. Tell me, I will be hopeful too. I'll be hopeful. If that's the only thing I saw every time I saw my mom. But most time, it's not really true. And I wanna be honest. Sometimes they, they weren't high last night because they knew today was visitation. So they're like, I want to I wanna show up sober. And that's what the kid gets to see for one hour. Why wouldn't you believe your mom and dad are doing the best they can if that's the only way? That is the hardship of being a false friend. That's the, the irony and the hard, sometimes that I have no answer to answer to any question or to my children. That's the truth the truth of being a false friend. Thank you for watching. We appreciate you, our village. When I was a kid, I didn't have a place to call home. And so that's what we're trying to do here is promote those um, room makeovers and such to help kids find a forever home. Absolutely. We want to do room makeovers for mostly teens and foster parents. And here's how you can help you. You can donate by clicking the link in the bio so we can do more room makeovers for teens so they feel they are hard, seen, and known. We cannot do it alone. With your help, we will truly help as many teens as we can. Yep.